Hello, I'm Stephanie Quine with the Weekly Law Report. Don't forget, our inaugural Women in Law Awards is fast approaching. For your chance to win a double pass to the event in Melbourne, be listening to the question at the end of this week's top stories. A seminar hosted by King & Wood Mallisons and the Australian Red Cross has explored how international humanitarian law is struggling to keep up with cyber warfare and drone technology. Professor of International Law Stephen Freeland spoke to a crowd of around 200 on the changing face of warfare in the 21st century. The assumptions in the law is that somebody would bash the other guy in the head. Are the rules clear? Expert in drones and cyber warfare, Dr Emily Crawford went on to explain how the United States has created a global battlefield by conducting drone strikes in Yemen and Somalia. We're going after the people regardless of where they are in the world, regardless of whether the state in which they are residing or, or happen to be at that moment is actually engaged in an armed conflict. Targeted killings are permitted under international humanitarian law if the person being targeted can be considered a combatant or a civilian taking direct part in hostilities. This, however, technically includes CIA agents. You can only imagine the situation if a party adverse to the US were to start practicing against the US what they've been practicing to everyone else. The suggestion that Islamic Sharia law could work in parallel with Australian law was dismissed last week by former High Court Chief Justice Sir Gerard Brennan. At a UNSW lecture, Brennan said no court could apply two parallel systems of law, especially if they reflect different fundamental standards. Some religious leaders have called for legal pluralism, which recognises Muslim laws in relation to financial transactions, marriage and divorce. But Brennan said there is no community when basic moral standards are in conflict. Michael Kirby has criticised law students of his generation for not questioning the status quo. Kirby was speaking last week at a 50-year reunion of law students from his Sydney Uni cohort. Kirby said his classmates, including himself, were too complacent in their youth about inequalities faced by women, the denial of Aboriginal land rights, gay rights and the White Australia policy. Kirby was encouraged, however, that law students of this generation are more passionate in their approach. He was also encouraged by the higher number of women now studying law, compared to his graduating class, which included only six women. Slater and Gordon's failed class action against the maker of anti-arthritis drug Vioxx has led to a 10.5% profit drop for the firm. The failed class action sought damages for people who suffered heart attacks after taking the anti-inflammatory non-steroid drug Vioxx. The failed class action led to a $10.5 million earnings loss for the firm. Total revenue was up 19.4%, however, with the recently acquired UK firm Russell Jones and Walker adding around $12 million to Slater's revenue result. Managing Director Andrew Gretsch said there was still major potential to exploit the Slater's brand beyond the personal injuries market. Those were our top stories this week, and if you've been following our coverage of Stephen Gagler's appointment to the High Court, you may know just how many women judges sit on the High Court bench. If you know the answer, you can email me at stephanie.quine at readbusiness.com.au for your chance to win a double pass to our inaugural Women in Law Awards in Melbourne this October. I'm Stephanie Quine, thanks for watching.